The Tom Woods Show, episode 642. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, gang, I got an easy way for you to earn 50 smackers. You listening? Ebates has changed its reward policy. You refer two friends and you get 50 bucks. Ebates rewards you for shopping at a wide array of online retailers with cash rebates. And you get 50 smackers if you refer just two friends. Surely you have two friends, then you can have 50 smackers in your pocket. Check it out at tomwoods.com slash ebates. Folks, if you enjoy this show, you're really going to like the free course I've made available to you on the real history of the U.S. presidents. Very, very helpful, especially during an election year. Check it out at freehistorycourse.com. All right, everybody, warning. I'm warning you, this episode is not for delicate flowers, okay? We are we're taking on a controversial issue. I don't actually think it's controversial at all. <laughs> That's the thing. I, I don't see that this is controversial. This is obviously a fact. We're talking about the Israel lobby today, and we're doing so with Grant Smith, who is the author of the new book, Big Israel, How Israel's Lobby Moves America. Grant Smith is director of research at the Institute for Research Middle Eastern Policy in Washington, D.C. Grant, welcome to the show. Grant Smith, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me on. So you got this book, and it's called Big Israel, and as I just got done telling you, it's also a big book, uh, although it really is only, it's a little over 300 pages, but boy, do you pack a lot in this book. There is no fluff in here. No, it's got 41 charts, it's yeah. got a full footnote, and uh, the idea is to really have everything solidly backed up with citations. Yeah, and you know, the thing is, with a topic like this, you really have no choice, because you're already going to be assumed to be a bad guy just for Correct. writing a book about this, so you've yeah. got to make sure everything Every T is crossed and every I is dotted. Let, why don't we, in fact, start right there yeah. at, ab about this being one of the handful of topics in the U.S. that so many people want to run away from or scared of, even if they agree with you. In, in you know, of course, they they have a functioning brain, so they know that what you're saying is obviously true, but they don't dare write you a blurb or talk to you in public and whatever. Just comment on that fact alone. Sure. Well, there's really no. Uh, upside to getting into this topic. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you're not making a, a bundle of dough, I assume, doing it. No, not trying to make a bundle of dough either. It's really all about you know we've got these great uh, beginnings on looking at some of the output in terms of you know what, how does kind of a, a heavy concentration of interest in Israel affect foreign policy, and you have the Stephen Walt and John Mearsheimer book about that. So you've got a lot of great stuff on output. Not too much on input, though. And personally, I don't feel, uh, you know, you, you could say it's like walking into a minefield with a, a pocket full of unpinned grenades, but I don't feel it's as, you know, it's controversial when you really drill down on facts and avoid any sort of uh, anecdotal approach, which I'm, I'm afraid some of the beginning... Uh, research in this. If you talk about uh, you know books uh, from Congressman Paul Finley back in the day, which was uh, they dare speak out, really talking about his experience and, and getting a lot of pushback when he wanted to do things in Congress and some other books. If you really look at money, if you look at the growth of of various organizations, how they started out, what they're doing now, I think it uh, decontroversializes it a bit, and I think that people. Uh, particularly in this country, are going to be interested in a factual-based look at 336 organizations and what they're doing to, uh, as the book says, move America. There was a guy. Now you'll you'll know the name certainly. Some of my younger listeners might not. Uh, Joe Sobrin. Oh yeah. Who used to write for National Review, and then he was purged. You know, he was right. given that he was one of the last decent people, it was only a matter of time that he'd be purged. And he was purged in an essay by Bill Buckley in right. which he was accused of being quote obsessed with and cuckoo about Israel. And this is something now I have a libertarian show here and a lot of libertarians right. are getting attacked as anti-Semitic because they focus so much on Israel. And this and and I always thought that was a bizarre thing to say. The reason there's focus on Israel is that 
there is this tremendous pressure placed right. on the U.S. government to do certain things in foreign policy. If there were that much pressure from you know the the, the government of Azerbaijan, there'd be a lot of interest in Azerbaijan. It's not Absolutely. because we have a particular animus toward Azerbaijanis. Right, right. And you've got this whole drive right now for the declassification of these pages on possible Saudi involvement in 9-11. Saying that those pages should be released doesn't make you anti-Saudi either, whether there is anyone who's pro-Saudi or not, who knows. But, you know, I remember hearing a brilliant piece by Scott McConnell of the American Conservative at one of our conferences at the National Press Club, and he really brilliantly outlines the purging of many uh, thinkers who were critics on this issue and how it really has dumbed down many magazines and, and many areas of, of uh, debate, particularly uh, some of the publications he worked in. So I, I agree. Uh, it's, not, it's not healthy at all. Uh, but you see that people are weathering it. I mean, uh, Stephen Walt, a uh, realist foreign policy guy, and John Mearsheimer, uh, they're still actively employed. We can still hear their voices. So I think that's a good sign. That, that's right. In fact, I can't remember if he said this. I think he said it on the air when I talked to Stephen Walt. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll, I'll link to that episode on our show notes page for today. But he, he, uh, he said, well, when I came to the conclusion that I was satisfied never to work in the U.S. government again, then I decided to write this book. <laughs> yeah, and that's – I mean that's a shame because to the extent that uh, – Anyone with a lot of talent should work in the U.S. government. I just think that uh, it's a shame that someone feels that way, yeah, but he yeah. probably is right. All right, let's 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 dive into the book. You talk about uh, a concept that I guess you coined the term, Israel affinity organizations. Right. And this is a helpful term because I think a lot of people who know the subject only casually would think we're only dealing with APAC, the American-Israeli Political Action Committee, and it goes so much farther than that. Right. I, I basically divided them up into four groups, and, and the concept that I'm putting forward organizationally is that there are Israel affinity organizations which have a top objective as advancing Israel by activities in the United States, and that they're basically organized into those that try to obtain subsidies and pass them to Israel, those that are lobbying-oriented or rather ad advocacy organizations uh, a third category of fundraising and local political actions trying to push state governments to do things. Uh, and then finally, just education organizations that are very interested in <laughs> educating Americans. But I would, I would say that many of them are also uh, putting out a lot of disinformation that really has changed what Americans think they know. Let's talk about that. You have a section in the book, a chapter on education. Right. And th this is, and by education, you really you mean opinion forming and an attempt to influence opinion in America. Right. What form does this take? Well, it takes the form of socializing people into a certain set of beliefs. So this, you know, this can take the form of, you know, bringing in uh, as was uh, as has been the case, a lot of very pro-Israel speakers into deliver lectures in you know colleges, universities, even you know K through twelve education, increasingly, uh, really presenting uh, textbooks and information that are you know takes sort of a very pro-Israel view of. Uh, situations. It, it takes the uh, you know a whole a whole host of uh, educational organizations that are making the argument of the need for strong American support for Israel, whether it's museums or libraries and that sort of thing, and just generating a lot of articles and information that have as a beginning point the idea that the U.S. should be strongly and unconditionally supporting Israel. So, um, you know, within. Uh, the United States discourse, you know, this is not um, this is not uncommon. There are a lot of organizations that I've listed in the appendix uh, that I would put in the education category. It's not the biggest segment of what I would call collectively the lobby, but it's a it's a large and important segment. Now, granted that you know no one can you know actually shut people up literally on at least most topics. At the same time, is there are there ways that these different groups use to at least intimidate people into voluntarily more or less silencing themselves? Oh, yeah. I would not say that those are educational organizations. I, I put those in the advocacy segment of my, uh, of my uh, dichotomy here. And, and clearly organizations such as Myths and Facts, uh, there's another organization um, called Flame, Facts and Logic about the Middle East – 
uh, and others that are very actively going after and trying to mold uh, what appears in mainstream media. And so they don't typically bother with uh, a blog or a uh, you know small uh, circulation publication, but they can be relentless in going after the New York Times, uh, C-SPAN, in case they have a guest they don't like or a program they don't like, and really just generally making the life of the editor and the, uh, the writers miserable so that they come to the view that it's just better off perhaps not writing some stories and rather, uh, rather than taking a critical stance that they know will get them in trouble with these media watch organizations. Can you tell us something about the organization called J Street that's – I mean it's new-ish and what it's – how it's different from other Jewish organizations and if in your view – like, what is your opinion of it? Well, uh, my opinion at the beginning, along with a great deal of other uh, watchers, was that, hey, here comes an organization that seems younger, savvier. It's led by a guy who, you know, is clearly pro-Israel, but, uh, you know, had family in Tel Aviv for a long time, uh, you know, and, and, but even before the state was formed. and But yet it's going to sort of challenge some of the very hard line pro settlement um, attitudes and and maybe even uh, hold uh, a bit of pressure on the unconditional aid that flows from the US. Um, as I've written in the book, it, it turns out that uh, the organization is probably not quite living up to uh, its original billing as being uh, an organization that's that's going to offer a, a lot a lot of contra uh, and uh, juxtaposition to some of the mainline organizations like APAC. They clearly don't have the amount of money. And what you see is that a lot of the younger sort of more, uh, you know, activist um, uh, participants have bailed out and gone to Jewish Voice for Peace and other organizations kind of disappointed that uh, when it came down to things, uh, you know, they were very good on uh, the Iran nuclear deal in terms of wanting that rather than a war with Iran. But uh, they're not seeing enough difference with some of the mainline advocacy organizations that are up there. And I think their revenues have suffered a bit because of it. So I've included them as kind of part of this Israel lobby in my book. Yeah, that was what surprised me, was to see okay. them classified that way. And that was only because I haven't followed them. I, I knew they existed, but mm -hmm. I hadn't known about, I guess, what you know close watchers would have known, which is that they didn't quite turn out to be what they had been cracked up to be at the start. Well, they left a lot of space uh, for a younger organization to come in and say, look, we really do not approve uh, of uh, this ongoing settlement activity. We really do not approve of, of some of the mainline positions that you're taking when you join up with APEC. And so they, they left themselves exposed. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, they're doing a huge event here in Washington. Uh, they're having the vice president come and talk. And so they do... Um, you know, it, people, I think other observers' enthusiasm for them as a juxtaposition of, of APAC waxes and wanes, but uh, for the most part, uh, mainly due, again, to this formation of a younger, faster-moving organization that's growing geometrically, it looks as though they kind of didn't fulfill their promise. Tell me about your Chapter 8, Coordination and Suppression. <laughs> well, we're going by chapters now. Well, coordination and suppression. Well, you have a top a title like that. I got to ask. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let me flip to my own book here because uh, it's 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 uh, coordination and suppression is basically about how some of these organizations are out there um, really working uh, day and night to um, make sure that some of the main drivers uh, behind APAC are, are in the line. What, what a lot of people don't worry or really realize when they look at um, APAC is that it is the designated driver for Congress. I mean, it's, uh, if you look at its organizing documents, uh, what you see is that it was set up to really consolidate the power of a number of other organizations that are automatic members uh, of APAC uh, and be able to say, look, you know, we're really representing the establishment of all these organizations in their lobbying. So the coordination um, that happens also of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, 
which functions out of this sort of supermarket of um, financial institutions connected with Israel, the Jewish Agency, the Conference of Presidents, and others in a location in New York, is really to try to make sure that when an issue comes up, again, such as the Iran nuclear deal, that they're all basically singing off the same sheet. And this goes from the federations that fund a lot of these organizations locally to the Conference of Presidents, to the other members, the large organizations such as the ADL, uh, certainly um, the American Jewish Committee, which does a lot of overseas work. It's been referred to as sort of the State Department of the lobby. Make sure that they're all singing uh, off the same song sheet, so to speak. So, you know, the, the lobbying priorities that come up, uh, you can't have a lot of rogue organizations uh, singing off key. And so the, the idea of the, this uh, coordination is there. Now, sometimes some organizations uh, begin to sing off key and begin to criticize. And one of the case studies in this report, uh, in the final report, was really about how um, the Center for American Progress, which is a democratic think tank, had a number of authors who were, who were justifiably pointing to major Israel lobby funding donors as being involved in making some very uh, unfounded and harmful, they call it Islamophobic, uh, programs targeting Muslims in America. Uh, there had to be a cleaning of house, and all of the authors, the main authors of that report, were subsequently jettisoned from CAP. Uh, the other case study in the book was the coordination suppression uh, of Rula Jabril. You have this or other organization headed by Josh Block, who's an a former APAC spokesman. Uh, when he found out that Rula Jabril, who is this MSNBC uh, very uh, interesting uh, analyst of the Middle East was going to be on Voice of America, got in there, uh, was in contact with the producer to get her out and try and put in a Washington Institute for Near East Policy voice uh, who, although he was uh, Arab, Palestinian, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, would sing the appropriate notes uh, concerning the region uh, from the APAC think tank, which is WINAP. So, it you know, the, the case studies in the book about coordination and suppression really have to do with the coordination of all these different organizations and uh, the suppression of voices that uh, are either inside and have to be jettisoned or outside and have to be suppressed. What's so interesting about everything you've just said is that when I then look at your chapter about American public opinion, uh -huh. the trend in American public opinion is away from all the you know sort of Likudnik, extremely hawkish pro-Israel positions in spite of all the things you just said. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, <clears throat> there's no doubt about it that particularly in Gallup polls where I guess through uh, the luck of the alphabet, uh, Iran comes before Israel – um, you know, Israel fun factors very well uh, in general favorability ratings among Americans. But if you begin to ask uh, questions falling into the, I'm going to give you some data, please respond to this, you tell them how much the aid is and how much it is relative, you know, American foreign aid uh, to Israel, how much it is relative to other countries, then you find out most people are actually opposed to it. Um, you know, it's it's an interesting juxtaposition when you look at, yeah, they're favorable, but they're really not all that much in favorable of paying for billions and billions in foreign aid. So you find that. Uh, you also find, however, that Americans are stunningly misinformed about a lot of things. I mean, back in the run-up to this uh, deal with Iran, you found uh, one of our polls through Google Consumer Research, statistically significant, found back in 2014 that almost 59% of Americans believed in 2014 that Iran already had nuclear weapons. That's how much hype oh, is yeah. out there floating around, you know, yeah. And so you just, it, it causes despair. Um, and, and a lot of other things that are very much in sync with what the lobby in general would like Americans to believe uh, are out there. And one of, the, one of the recent polls that we did in four countries 
was just asking, you know, fundamental questions about property rights. <laughs> Basically, the poll was March of this year. Which of the following do you believe to be true? We asked. Do Israelis occupy Palestinian lands or do Palestinians occupy Israeli lands? Between the UK, Canada, Mexico, and the US, the US was really the only country where the plurality, 49.2%, believed that Palestinians were occupying you Israelis. You have to be kidding me. No, I, I, I'm afraid not, Tom. So it, it's we're out of sync. Um, we're out of sync you in think? terms <laughs> of yeah, basic facts. And of course, if you don't have basic facts, um, you know, how can you make any decisions? You can, how can you make any decisions? Yeah, no, it's it's correct. Now, on the other hand, let's talk about we've talked about American public opinion. I want to talk about a more specific strain of American public opinion. I, I wrote a a book with Basic Books. It was a it was an anthology of anti war writing in U.S. history, and my co editor was Murray Polner of the Jewish Peace Fellowship. And I asked him when I had him on the show about well, why is it that everybody acts as if the Jewish, quote-unquote, view on foreign policy is the view being pushed by the Israel lobby, whereas if I polled American Jews, I'd get a very different answer. Right. Well, And yet I, I'm anti-Semitic, so-called, for taking the exact opinion that most American Jews themselves take. Yeah, that's probably the biggest canard that the lobby's been advancing. And, and unfortunately, the mainstream media also pretty much buys that hook, line, and spirit sinker, at least they pretend to. But, I mean, you're right. The Pew survey that was out in 2014 basically says that if you look at these claims that somehow these organizations are representative of the American uh, Jewish population, that's absolutely not the case. Um, you find that only 82% well 82% of uh Jewish Americans don't belong to any of these organizations so they've got about 12% that are members uh most are not attached at all to Israel only about you know it, it's something like 70% are somewhat or not at all attached 57% have never gone there 44% think settlement building is a bad idea so in terms of the, the continual claims and the conflation, I think that's probably the scariest thing for, for people who don't even like to get into discussions on religion and politics and don't like to talk about Christian evangelicals or you know, Catholics or uh, you know, any of these denominations. They really probably don't want to get into a discussion of, hey, can you tell me, uh, Mr. Israel Lobby Organization Representative, how many members do you actually have? I mean, what what are we talking about here? But the, our estimate in the book, based on this Pew survey and multiplying it times the uh, adult population, is you've got about just less than a million, 774,000 adults or even members of these organizations. And, and to say, as the, unfortunately, as the ADL, APAC, American Jewish Committee and Conference of Presidents, implied when they were out there opposing the Iran nuclear deal that this was a reflection of generalized American Jewish support. That's just not true because the general American support was 53%. 59% of Jewish Americans supported the deal. So they were clearly taking their cues and, and representing something else. Yeah, that to me, they can't – I don't know how they deal with that. They, I think they just ignore it. Now, I don't think they're challenged on it. I think that's yeah, that's true. Problem. It's not It's not brought up. It's just no. it's just taken for granted that right. you represent Jewish opinion. Now, I, I know it's not in the book, but I still feel like I, I just have to ask your opinion on the whole Donald Trump phenomenon. Now, I didn't see his speech to AIPAC, but I'm told it was the typical pandering speech that we might expect. Right. But th there's something a little bit more compli complicated about Trump. And I forget who it was. It might have been Scott McConnell. Somebody over at the American Conservative made the point that every single time he wins a caucus or a primary, it is another nail in the, the lobby's coffin because here's a guy who has – yeah, I mean sometimes he says pro-Israel things. But on the other hand, he says things that are absolutely forbidden, and he's getting away with it again and again. Yeah. The, the guy I heard saying that loudly over at Anti-War was Justin Raimondo, and he basically was making the point – the same point was that he was kind of showing that when someone stands up and says, I want to be even-handed, as Trump did, I'm a deal-maker, 
you can't really say that you're going to unconditionally support one side and expect to be able to make a deal. You know, the real estate guy talking about land deals. Um, he managed to get away with that, and he didn't lose support. Uh, among Christian evangelicals. He didn't lose support uh, among the people who are following him and really did reveal that you can, uh, if you have a certain trajectory and resources behind you, you can uh, resist the, uh, the, the mantras that you're supposed to spout. But of course, you know, then he did make his APAC speech, uh, suspiciously using teleprompters and uh, following a closer, tighter script. But uh, I, I do find that fascinating, and at our conference on March 18 at the National Press Club, uh, that was probably one of the more interesting analyses. Was was really about uh, how does how does this happen, and what does it reveal about the strength of the lobby? Now, your subtitle is "How Israel's Lobby Moves America." Right. W- when you say America, do you mean government officials, or do you mean the American public? Well, in this case. The real argument is that federal agencies, uh, whether it's the Department of Energy and the State Department, which actually have crafted a gag order forbidding any government employer or contractor from admitting the obvious, which is that Israel has nuclear weapons, uh, or the Treasury Department, which continually dodges questions about whether tax-exempt or tax-deductible donations are going into illegal settlements, which the government says it opposes. Uh, There's a lot of uh, pushing and moving government federal agencies, basically. So the argument, the core argument of the book is not so much that Americans are being moved, is that that they are being tugged along by unrepresentative, and and we would even argue... uh, you know, almost criminally negligent federal agencies, whether it's Department of Justice, Treasury, uh, even the CIA, even the State Department, even the Department of Energy, who whenever there comes uh, a conflict of interest or a crisis, whether it's espionage, nuclear theft, tax questions, et cetera, et cetera, they basically cover it up, run away, ignore, obfuscate, Uh, And in in the cases of the IRS, even try and destroy their own ability to uh, enforce their own regulations. So uh, the entities being moved and and what's in the final chapter, urging Americans to challenge those federal agencies to push back on them, uh, is really what's being moved in this case. Uh, Take a couple minutes to tell us about your institute. Yeah, the Institute for Research Middle Eastern Policy is a 501c3 I set up. Uh, I've spent half of my life in the private sector, started out doing market research, American Express Financial Advisors, did a stint at a business school in Latin America, had a lot of experience researching markets for Yankee Group Research, the whole Porter analysis. And I really wanted to get back into something I had done in the late 80s, which was looking at lobbies and their impacts on governments. I'd done some work as part of a Minnesota Citizens League commission looking at lobbying. So uh, just uh, back in 2001, when uh, I was as confused as everybody uh, who I consider to be important about the rush for war in Iraq, I decided to bring some of those research and analysis skills and focus them on the forces propelling America into these horrific uh, incursions into the Middle East, and I have not been lacking for subject matter since. So, um, you know, function on a relatively small uh, donor base in terms of dollar amounts, but we've done some big things. Uh, this is about the eighth book about the lobby. We do an annual conference. Uh, the website's irmep.org. Uh, we also put out uh, podcasts, email alerts such and so forth, and really trying to focus on this issue, um, not so much as just strictly looking at foreign policy, but as a domestic issue that really needs to be examined closely. Have you yourself suffered in any way at the hands of any of these organizations? Have they targeted you in any way? Um, not, not in any way that really impacts me. I think uh, I don't want to um, – there, there are some – funny things that happens to anybody who comes into this space, but uh, I w- I'm just going to say 
there have been some funny things that have happened, but I kind of keep those in my back pocket. Okay, fair enough. Got it. All right, so I'm going to link to your site, which is uh, – is it I, it's IRMEP.org? Is that what you just said? Yeah, it's IRMEP.org. Um, if anyone wants to take a look at some of the presentations made at our last big conference, 400 people in Washington, uh, that's Israel'sInfluence.org. Get a wide range of opinions on uh, how this uh, impacts America. And then the book is Big Israel, and that's on sale at Amazon.com in paperback, and we should have a Kindle version out by June. Okay, so I'm going to link to both your website and to the book at tomwoods.com slash 642. Well, uh, Grant, I've, I've, uh, it's been a pleasure to get to know you for the first time, and, and good yeah. luck with the book. Well, I hope to be on again sometime. I appreciate the opportunity. That'd be great. Thanks, Tom. All right, that's going to do it for today. Tomorrow we're going to be talking about intellectual diversity on college campuses. So you know, that'd be a short episode. But we're going to talk about the phenomenon of actually, actually intellectual conformity among faculties on college campuses. So that's going to be a fun conversation. How could that not be fun? Um, make sure you grab my book, Bernie Sanders is Wrong, though, because we're going to run out of time that that book is still relevant. So, but it's, you know, whether Bernie's in there or not, the ideas are still going to be, you know, cursing us. So I've got a free ebook that goes through the main planks of the Bernie platform and, and uh, dismantles them. So you can check that out at BernieIsWrong.com. Doesn't cost you a cent, and it's a good, it's not like one of these, usually you get a free ebook and it's 20 triple space pages. This is a 150 page book. It's an actual book, and I'm just handing it to you. So go enjoy that at BernieIsWrong.com, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.